This is Advanced Algebra Lesson 6-2, Absolute Value, Square Roots, and Quadratic Equations. When we look at absolute value, you studied this in geometry and in algebra. We're going to just dig a little bit deeper this time. When we take a look at the definition, it's the absolute value of n can be described geometrically as the distance of n from 0 on the number line. I took just two really basic values, 3 and negative 3. If I take the absolute value of 3, I get 3. If I take the absolute value of negative 3, I get 3, because both 3 and negative 3 are 3 places from 0 on a number line. Now when I look at it algebraically, the absolute value of a number can be defined piecewise as follows. If I take the absolute value of x, I get x when x is greater than or equal to 0. For example, the 3 that I used. When I take the absolute value of 3, I get the same value of 3, but that's when x is greater than or equal to 0. Now I use a value that was less than 0, I use negative 3. When I put a negative 3 in, I got an answer of 3 when I took the absolute value. So the value that I put in and the value that I took out are opposites of each other. So that's why you see the absolute value of x is equal to the opposite of x when x is less than 0. Next I'd like to take a look at solving for x when absolute value is involved. We know that when I put a single value in there, I know that I can have either the positive or the negative, and I still come out with the same number of 3. So the same thing would apply here when I'm looking at x plus 6. I can either have a positive value or a negative value and still get 7.2. So I'm going to actually have to solve for x twice. So I'm going to go x plus 6 equals 7.2, or x plus 6 is equal to a negative 7.2. So if I solve for x in both of those instances, x is either 1.2 or x is a negative 13.2. Because 1.2 plus 6 is 7.2, the absolute value of 7.2 is 7.2, or negative 13.2 plus 6 is equal to a negative 7.2 but the absolute value of a negative, point seven, or of a negative 7.2 is 7.2. So both values are our solution, make the solution for x. The next part I'd like to look at is the absolute value function in terms of a graph. When I insert values for x that are greater than 0, I know that they're going to be on this, in this quadrant, and so it would form a ray from 0 going upward with a slope of 1. If I insert 1 in place of x, I get 1 for my output. 2 in place of x, 2 is my output, and so on. So it is a ray starting at 0 with a slope of 1. Now, when looking at f of x equals the absolute value of x, when x is less than 1 or 0, we know that negative 1 would have an absolute value of 1, negative 2 would have an absolute value of 2. So in this situation, the ray starts at 0 and goes off in a negative direction with a slope of negative 1. In this next section, I'd like to relate absolute value and square roots to each other. So when k is greater than or equal to 0, the solutions to x squared equals k are the positive and the negative square roots of k, namely square root of k and the opposite of square root of k. Now I'd like you to do this activity, and I'm going to define the values for you to put in here first, but the activity can be found on page 381 in your textbook. But before I have you stop the video, I'm going to input the values that I'd like you to explore. So in this activity, I'd like you to consider the functions f and g with equations f of x equaling the square root of x squared, and g of x equaling the absolute value of x. Now what I've done is I've chosen some values that meet the constraints that are here in the left-hand column. I needed to pick a value for x that was less than a negative 10, so I chose negative 15, one that was between negative 10, negative 1, and so on down the row or down the column. I've input the values that I'd like you to explore. What I'd like you to do is stop the video, fill in the next two columns, fill in f of x when your x value is squared and you take the, abs or the square root and then you take the absolute value of x in the g of x column. So please stop the video and fill in your table. As you can see with my table, my values for, whenever I put my values for x, 
or for whatever values for x I used, if I took f of x equaling the square root of x squared or g of x equals the absolute value of x, my relationship between f of x was equal to my relationship with g of x. So that leads us to the absolute value square root theorem that says for all real numbers x, the square root of x squared is equal to the absolute value of x. We can use the absolute value square root theorem when solving equations like ax squared equals b. Here I have a, a problem that I'd like you to explore. We take a look at 3x squared equals 120 and we solve that algebraic. We, algebraically we know that we can divide both sides by 3 and so x squared would equal 40. And then if I took the square root of x squared and that would equal the square root of 40, we know that the absolute value of x is equal to the square root of x squared which would equal the square root of 40 and so we know that the absolute value of x would equal could be the square root of 40 or it could be the square or the opposite of the square root of 40 so we can write that a little bit shorter by going plus minus square root of 40. Now there's one other little piece that we need to explore just briefly. The square root of 40 isn't simplified. We can take a look at the square root of 40 as 4 times 10. I chose 4 times 10 because 4 is a perfect square. So I know that the square root of 4 is 2 and then I would have the square root of 10. So this is its simplified form. So plus or minus the square root of 40 is also the same as plus or minus 2 times the square root of 10. And so that would be its simplest form. That little skill, skill there that I performed with you here is something that we will explore more as we progress through this course. The next example that I have to, for us to look at is going to involve area again, just like we did in lesson one, but this time we're going to have to solve for our squared term and so we're going to utilize that absolute value square root theorem again. The example to number three is as follows. An, ex an equilateral triangle and a circle have the same area. So the triangle and the circle have the same area. The triangle has side length 20 centimeters. Which is greater, the side length of the triangle or the diameter of the circle? So before we even begin this problem, I need to explore this equilateral triangle that I'm working with. It has side length of 20. And I know that the triangle and the circle have the same area. Because I know the side length of the triangle is 20, I'm going to explore the area of the triangle first. So I'm going to break that into two pieces here. And then I'm going to go back to your geometry course when we explored um, special triangles, the 20, or I'm sorry, the 30, 60, 90 triangle. And we know that the short side is 10, the long leg is 10 times the square root of 3, and then our hypotenuse is 2 times 10, which is 20. So with that said, I know that my triangle height is equal to 10 times the square root of 3, and the area. So the area of my triangle would be 1 half times the base, which would be 20, times the height, which is 10 times the square root of 3. And if you work that out, that means the triangle, the area of my triangle would be 100 times the square root of 3. So since my problem says that the areas are the same, I know that the circle area is 100 times square root of 3. So area of a circle is pi r squared, and I want to now solve this equation for r. So I'm going to divide both sides by pi, which would then give me r squared equals 100 times the square root of 3 over pi. Then we're going to go back to that absolute value square root theorem and take the square root of both sides. So that means that the square root of r squared would give me r equals plus or minus the square root of 100 times the square root of 3 all over pi but this is a triangle and we would not have a negative value for a side length or a diameter or a radius I should say so we're just going to use the positive value this time and now this is a, a situation where I would not leave it here I would just get the approximate value when re dealing with the circle so the radius of the circle would be 7.425 
so the diameter would be 14.85. So the side length of my triangle is 20, and the diameter of my circle is 14.85. 14 14 so the side length of the equilateral triangle is greater. There's one more piece to this lesson that we need to just talk about. It's nothing that's new to you. You've defined rational and irrational numbers before. But since we're going to be using so many irrational numbers in this in this chapter, we want to make sure that our understanding is, is fresh. So rational numbers, it's a number that can be represented as a simple fraction or the ratio of the form a over b, where a and b are both integers and b is not equal to zero. So when we look at irrational numbers, it's a number that is not rational, that is, it cannot be expressed as a simple fraction or a ratio of the form a over b, where a and b are both integers and b is not equal to zero. So when we looked at the square root of 40, or 2 times the square root of 10, that is an example of an irrational number. And then when we looked at the previous example with the, the square root of 100 times the square root of 3 all over pi, that is also an example of an irrational number. This concludes Lesson 6-2.